This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice. I'm Richard Looney, one of the pastors of Church Street United Methodist Church, and I welcome you to this time of worship. In a moment, we will be looking at the gospel lesson from Matthew, the third chapter, verse 1 through 12, as we continue in the season of Advent. But in the meantime, I invite you to listen to the adult choir sing Ava Maria. We celebrate today the second Sunday of Advent, a time of anticipation with expectancy, also a time of preparation as we receive again the good news of Christ coming into the world. Uh, hear these words from the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, John the Baptist gives us a wonderful outline of how we should observe this uh, Advent season. Will you join me as we read together? In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptizing by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. 
Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Uh, John must have been quite a sight, clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, eating only locust and wild honey. And yet there was something so compelling about his message that people came out from Jerusalem and all over Judea to hear him and to be baptized as a symbol of repentance and cleansing. Uh, John is one of the famous characters of the New Testament. Later in the 11th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. And he said, what did you go out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Well, obviously John was not that. He had challenged the authority of Herod to marry his brother's wife, Herodias. He was in jail for that. He said, did you go to see one in fine raiment? Uh, no, John was in camel hair. And Jesus said, if you wanted to see fine raiment, you would have gone to the, to the palace. What you did see, he said, was a prophet, and yet a greater than a prophet. No one born of woman greater than John the Baptist. And then Jesus added, but even the least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John the Baptist, because a new reality has come. The kingdom through the Messiah is near, is at hand. And we're called to be prepared uh, for this coming. You remember the continuing story of John, and we won't dwell there, but uh, he was locked up because of his stern words to Herod. And nothing happened to him because uh, Herod was afraid of the people and knew how much they respected John. But then uh, the daughter of, his, of Herodias did a dance for Herod, and he was so pleased that he said, I'll give you whatever she wants. And her mother instructed her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. So he was beheaded and the head given uh, to the daughter. So we know this brief amount about John. Uh, we know that uh, Jesus used him later as an illustration of how fickle people were. He said, John came either not eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he was possessed by a demon. He said, I came and ate and uh, drank, and you said he was a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. And then he, they said, he eats with sinners. Well, let's return to John's message for us at Advent. I'd like for you to look at it in uh, three ways with three R's to help you remember this week as you prepare your own life uh, for his coming in you as we remember his coming in the past. First of all, John says, he is greater than I. He is one whose sandals I am not even worthy to carry. So this is a season to remember for ourselves and appropriate the truth that Jesus came as the Messiah, uh, the anointed one. Greater than John, greater than any to that point, because he will be ushering in the kingdom. Who is this one who came in the, as a babe in the manger? Who is this one who lived among us as one of us? Who is this one who suffered and died and was brought again from the dead and who now lives as not only our Savior, but as our Lord? I thought it might be instructive to look at how the church has tried to describe Jesus. And one of the ways to do that is to look at the, at the uh, 
creeds of the church. One of the earliest creeds was the Nicene Creed, and it's a very elaborate attempt to understand who Jesus is and what He came to bring. Listen carefully as I read these words from the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, equally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father, through Him all things were made. This is a beautiful echo of that magnificent first chapter of Colossians where Paul said, He is the image of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is head of the church. He is firstborn from the dead. He is the one in whom the fullness of God dwells. The creed goes on to say, For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. These magnificent words attempt to describe the reality seen in Jesus, fully human and fully divine. So as we observe this wonderful season, we uh, do it as we look back to the past and remember we do it also as we experience His living presence in the present, and we anticipate His return in glory at the end of time. This is so beautifully described in the creeds. The more familiar creed is the Apostles' Creed, and let's just remind you, and you may want to say it with me, we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. There are a couple of other uh, attempts to explain this wonderful mystery of incarnation. The faith of the Korean Methodist Church says it like this, We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. And then there's a modern affirmation that says, We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. I hope you will find time today and through this week to think hard and long about the meaning of the incarnation of Christ who came into the world, a human being born of a human mother, lived our life, was taught as the children were taught, worked with His hands as a carpenter, began His ministry and was misunderstood and slandered, finally cruelly abused, crucified, and buried. But then a th the third day rose from the dead. So we remember. But we also, in the words of John, are to repent. Realizing how much God loved us, re realizing the cost of our forgiveness, we are sorry that we have been sinful, and we're sorry that we have been self-centered. But repentance is more than being uh, sorry. A little boy can be caught by his mother in the cookie jar, 
And he may be sorry that he got caught, but he may not be sorry he was in the cookie jar. He may be uh, planning the next time his mother's out of sight and his, much, his next trip into the cupboard or the, the place where the cookies were stored. And sometimes we are like the little boy, we're, uh, we're sorry. But uh, our sorrow does not lead us to change our way of life. So our repentance, our sorrow, our being contrite, our regret must be turned into a turning away from ourself, turning away from our sin, and turning to a new way of life. I grew up in the coal fields of uh, West Virginia, and I love stories about uh, coal miners. And one of my favorite stories is about the old coal miner. He was a very uh, foul-mouthed fellow. He cursed all the time. He was the leader of the renegade group. But in a strange miracle, he came to a Methodist revival and was converted and promised to turn his back on his sin, which including his cursing. So the next day at, at work, the, uh, the miners laid bets on how soon this old uh, foul-mouthed fellow would start cursing again. Some of them bet $10 on 10 o'clock, some on 11, some on 12. But to their amazement, he got through lunch and into the afternoon. But finally, about 2 o'clock, he hit his thumb with a hammer. And as he had always done, he let out a curse. Well, they were ready to collect their money, but they were strangely moved when he just dropped to his knees and said, Uh-oh, Lord, you know I didn't mean that. I think that's a beautiful, simple prayer. Uh-oh, Lord, you know I didn't mean that. So to repent is not only to be sorry, not only to say, Uh-oh, but to repent is to drop on our knees or drop our head and simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't intend to do that. I hope you can forgive me. It's interesting that when Jesus began his ministry, he used these same words that John used. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A new order is being established, and we are to be different kinds of people. But repentance also means turning toward something. And in the sense of our faith, it means turning to Christ. He is not only our Savior, but He is our Lord. And we are to live under His direction and to practice His will. Uh, this uh, reminds us that we are to be uh, students of our Lord Everybody needs a teacher. But just to say Christ is our Lord does not mean we've become a pupil. One young man said that he had been a, a pupil of a certain famous professor. The professor said, well, he did sit in my class, but he was never a student. He, he never followed instruction or seemed to learn anything. And people look at us and know that we are followers of Christ. We're supposed to play the game differently. We have a different coach, and he teaches us to have a different kind of attitude. We are to allow Christ to direct us. Uh, Church Street provides through this season and in the spring especially a wonderful series of what we call master arts concerts. And I've always been interested in the fact when, when a famous organist or soloist or pianist comes, we always list under whom they studied. And that's supposed to affect our understanding of the kind of person they are. And wouldn't it be wonderful if each one of us could understand that we have studied under Jesus Christ? We've sought to understand the kind of life He wants us to live, the kind of person He wants us to be. Sometimes we are an embarrassment to our Lord Sometimes we're an embarrassment to our teacher. And my prayer that is in this holy season of giving and receiving, all of us will take stock of the kind of pupil, the kind of disciple, the kind of follower we have been for our Lord 
Jesus Christ. We remember who He is, Son of God, Son of Man. We repent of our selfishness and our sin, and we turn to Him as our teacher and as our guide. Thirdly, though, we, uh, we remember and we repent, and we reflect in our life the meaning of being a disciple. John said, produce fruits worthy of repentance. And he was particularly hard on the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, it's not enough that you are a leader. It's not enough that you are a respected one in the council. People expect you to live as you profess. They expect you to live as you expect others to live. And so it is for us. We are to reflect the values of our Lord. Now, John Wesley reminded us that this needs to happen in two ways. It happens inwardly. It happens as we seek to practice holy living, as we seek to be Christ-like in what we say and in what we do. The world is hungry for authentic followers of Christ. You remember how the world respect and loved uh, Sister Teresa, Mother Teresa, who gave her life for others, who was more interested in loving someone than being cared for herself. She had caught the spirit of Jesus who said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So in these days, I hope you will set aside time for prayer time for Bible reading, time for worship in your church, and time just to think about what it would be like to be a real follower of Jesus Christ, to be Christ-like in your words and in your attitudes. But this holiness is also outward as well. Wesley talked a great deal about the fact that there's no solitary salvation. We are saved that we may share God's love with others. Now Wesley talked about the grace that is prevenient, grace that seeks us out, that goes before. He talked about grace that is justifying, this wonderful love of God in Christ that covers our sins, that forgives our failures, and enables us to be justified, to be as if we were righteous. But Wesley also talked about sanctifying grace, a grace that cleanses us and helps us grow in Christ's likeness, but also a grace that enables us to reach out and live for other folks. When Wesley and a few students in Oxford established the Holy Club, they were very careful to study the scriptures and to pray but they were also very careful every day to do some deed of mercy, to visit someone in prison, to visit those who were being taken to their execution and offer the hope and forgiveness of Christ, to see that the poor were cared for and fed. And in this wonderful season, we do remember that we have obligation for the poor. Our churches provide baskets for the poor. We give gifts to provide clothing and gifts for children in poverty. And we need to remember that this is not just something for the season of Christmas. It's something for all of life and every day of life. So John, this strange prophet dressed in camel hair, came and said, One is coming greater than I. Be prepared for his coming. Repent of your sin and selfishness and be willing to reflect in your life and care the Spirit of Christ. As you think about this, listen as Hannah Gamble sings, For He Has Regarded.
Thank you for sharing in this time of worship. As you continue your observance, remember who Christ is. Repent of your sin and turn to Him as Savior and Lord and reflect Him in your life. You're invited to join us for worship at Church Street every Sunday at 8.30 and 11 or on Wednesday for Holy Communion at noon in the chapel. May this be a glorious season for you. May God bless and enrich and guide your life. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>